welcome to Stupid Charming, the penultimate episode. We're going to be today doing woodwork. As you can see, we're going to start on the fore end. I've already removed some metal work and I've already started doing a bit of sanding. So, what we're aiming to do, as you can see on a lot of these cheap guns, you have some marks underneath. I've just taken the top layer off. This is 400 grit, so nothing too saucy. I'm taking the top layer of wood off and we're exposing all of the marks underneath. So as soon as you take the top layer off, you can see I've now got a couple of really long, hard scratches that have taken dye down there and all of the swell marks from where they've hit it with an orbital sand. So, the plan to take the top layer off and then address each of these marks. So without further ado, let's get sanding. I like to get the top layer off dry. It just gives me that little bit more control, a bit of better visibility. And for the cost of a sheet of sandpaper, just be sure you don't overdo it or else you're going to do more damage to this wood than has already been done. It's quite interesting to see what you can't see um, with your naked eye once you do this. The high spots and the low spots, the nasty scratches that will just suddenly reveal themselves. Um, I mean, obviously you have to commit to taking wood off to find all this out, but you'll rarely regret it with a factory gun. Be careful not to touch the checkering as well. This paper is now spent. Throw it away, take yourself a new patch, carry on. with the fore end, as much as it's uh, not the most important part, it is a lot less forgiving than a stock. A stock's got a lot of places you can hide mistakes, a fore end does not. It also has a lot more checkering. Wow, I feel like there's a huge bump right there, and then a huge divot. Um, so there's a lot I can do about that. We're not rebuilding it, right? It's worth saying that I'm not too not too worried about the checkering. I do have a checkering tool, so I can always touch it up. Uh, if you're worried about the straight lines on the stock here, it's probably worth doing this with something hard. But I'm not. Actually, I think blending them in might add a little bit more class to this gun. Make it a little bit more <coughs> charming. If I do so, so. You can certainly see on the top the machine marks where it's ripped the open pores here. And this, uh, it's ripped big chunks out of this wood as it's gone. So if we might actually have to do something a little bit more serious to this in a bit. One of the problems we're going to face with this is the fact that there is not a lot of meat. Well, there's we've got excessive meat everywhere. There's not a lot of meat around your um, forehand lever here. Uh, so actually we have to be really careful around these edges. Pay attention before you start as to where your sort of your good wood to metal fit is and never ever breach that line. Ever. <laughs> to the point that sometimes it's easier to do it with the metal work on because you're going to be really scared about scratching the metal work. So you won't even go near it. One mark removed, I feel like I am on the road. All right. What we should do now is do around that forehead, front, and we have located all of our high and low points. All right, so what we're gonna do, uh, just to work these tops out before we go any further, before the next stage, you take a bit of this, certainly avoiding the back portion because again, we always look out of place. Just to get this across a piece of wood. Good lines there, just to take those flats off the top. It's beautiful that somebody's already dyed this for you to show you where to sand. It's the ultimate guide. Well, 
we're gonna do to this now. Personal favorite. We're gonna get it wet. Very telling that how wood takes water can be akin to how it takes oil and dye. So you can kind of A, C, see where the water soaks in most or less, or like that. but more to the point, it will show any dark spots up. It's not that ugly to be fair, you've got some nice flex coming through here. And actually we could get away with having this gun. So we've also here raised the grain a little bit. So we now know what we're on. So you can, at this juncture, decide A, continue dry, or B, go wet. Uh, which is what I'm gonna do. All right, whole point of wet and dry is it will last longer if it's wet. However, Get those, don't get this clogged up obviously like this. Go with grain. Right, I'm happy with that. That was surprisingly a lot easier than I thought it would be. Um, to die or not to die, that is the question. I feel like a little die might go a long way in this gun. So what you want to do before you die is make sure she is uniformly damp. And make sure, although the die is going to have to show up a whole new generation of marks. Uh, this is Bertrand Casey Walnut Stain a la Johnny. So I've added a few extra bits in there to get it to a, a colour and consistency and uh, essentially to a product I actually, I was going to say like. I quite like the Bertrand Casey Stain. Oh, you can use your fingers for this and actually it will waste less. Uh, but I'm trying to be less dirty, uh, mostly because of YouTube and not having black fingers because of dye oil and crap apparently gives off a uh, more authentic appearance any spots that stick out as um, like a sore thumb, a bit light Make sure you just dog with a little bit of extra stuff. It's also a good time. And 400 by the way, uh, a lot of people stop 400. If this gun was more worthwhile, we take it up to 1200, that is. 1200. And that's gonna do. So what we're gonna do this now is set it aside. Now it's dried a little bit, uh, we're going to take some wire wool, which is going to run over the top with wire wool. It's going to put a fine polish over it. It's almost like we're repeating processes from weeks ago. you want to get this wood as perfect as possible before you put oil in it um, and we're just going to do what we call uh, like a light oil finish to this but I'm going to go with grain seed or anything like that which is going to do a real nice easy maintainable oil finish uh, not far removed from what a factory might do uh, but just a little bit better um, probably you're going to oil it and wax it just with some natural stuff Stay away from the harsh chemicals, man. Whoa. That's actually quite nice. See, all you're doing is looking for... You can put water back on top here and you'll get that same sort of uh, 
uniform effect you have before you get to spot all those little bits you don't like. Actually, I'm quite happy with that, or I'm happy enough for this gun. And now, we're going to put this aside to dry properly uh, before we oil it, uh, whilst we do the stock. So the stock is a little different uh, in procedure. Firstly, I'm going to need to pull this pad off, which is uh, kind of heartbreaking, but that's fine, because uh, it's somewhere near a decent fit and finish, but we'll work with that. Uh, and that's to work around this headwork here. The wood metal fit isn't awful, uh, but what we're going to look to do is remove some of the swell mark, however, without reducing this past here. As I said, we can do this on the gun, and I could mask around here and so on and so forth. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Change my mind. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, don't leave open bottles lying around the place. Uh, as you can tell from the many stains on all of my clothes that I wear usually, if you leave a thing, do a thing, don't do the other thing, you're gonna get dirty. Bit of a difficult one. Are we going with electrical tape? Yeah, I'm just gonna have to go around the head there. Now, essentially, where the wood metal fit is particularly good. I'm not going to worry too much about these edges, because I've already done them. Just be careful, that's all I have to say here. And if anything, we're going to give ourselves a starter. We're going to start with water, and we're going to start on the back end. We're going to really worry about this, this pad fit more than anything else to start. <laughs> it look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> From the back, let's work. I mean, you can really see around here. See those grind marks? It's horrific. It's gonna be hard. <laughs> Similar to the fore end, what you're doing is you're just looking for those big scratches. Luckily, there are not too many that we haven't taken out, just through a bit of careful sanderizing. Oh, and the fact that we've already done a load of work to this part of the stock. All right, so before I turn it over, just get some paper and just wipe off all that water and wood gunk. And you're on. Here it goes. With the grain. Kind of hard when the grain does this swirly thing. That's fine. Uh, so around that nose, I forgot that I didn't actually finish around the nose when I was doing my thing the other day. Um, I did a fairly on good job, but um, really not quite good enough. <laughs> I know it's gonna bite me in the ass is that I know I should have put more effort in when I did this last week. It's a very different density of wood on the stock than what it is on the fore end. Vastly different actually. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna break some cardinal rules here and I'm gonna chisel out at this stage. I'm just gonna remove there's a couple of really nasty high spots and I'm gonna get the adult size chisel. This one right here. Go with the grain of the wood always. Find the grain of the wood. For anyone who's ever done green wood carving, it's a similar concept. Once you've found an easy way to cut, don't fight it. Go with it, man. Should we really address this beforehand? Um, an area knows my traits of the whole. Me saying all along, it's only cheap to charming. I know I'd regret saying it and skipping out on time. Um, 
But I won't, so I'm going to stop and put this chisel far away. To give you some concept of time, I've been going for an hour now. Um, I've got so far to go. Look at veins. Look at those veins going. I forgot how open we left this grain as well. The actual headwork around here isn't actually that great from the factory. Uh, the actual line to line, let's say. Uh, the wood metal fit in height is, is pretty poor and in, in gap is pretty poor, but as I've said along, this is not reserved to Webley 951, so don't even put off buying one, they're pretty bloody good. So now I'm going to start the really hard bit, uh, which is around the grip, keeping this level and keeping this flat. Uh, well, still doing a vaguely nice job all around this this bit that we touched earlier. Um, we're still leaving the will to leave, losing the will to live. Luckily, Karina brought me a cup of tea. Mm. It's still far too hot. But you know when you really need a cup of tea. It's one of those moments. All right, guys. So this camera's about to time out. Uh, whilst you're away, I'm gonna sand this, sand this, water this, and dye it the same as that fore end. And we'll be back when they've been drying for an hour and ready to put some oil in. Um, plus, I need to get some fresh air because it's, um, it's not even. It's hot. It's October and it's hot. Cheers. So, here we have it, a uh, dyed, dried bit of 951 wood. Literally no more to say about it other than this is going to be as exciting to you as it is to me. Cheap wood can do magical things when you put oil into it, either become very beautiful or hideous. I'm hoping for the latter. And we're going to go uh, with a real basic start to this. Um, because the whole point is, is, is we can do it at home. So I'm going to use my special sauce because it's unfair. Uh, we're going to use off the shelf English walnut preparation. Um, which I'm, I mean, it's not, not bad. Most of these things have exactly the same contents in. So Just make sure you shake it up. I did say I was going to do something else with this wood yesterday. I'm fairly confident, but you know, that changed. I am, for the sake of the viewer, going to open a brand new one of these use gloves um, because it's good for you on something. Well, those were budget, weren't they? I'm gonna use this one, it's a brand new pot. I've honestly never used English walnut preparation before. Give it a good shake. Oh, you're shaking muscles. Um, and that's probably quite a lot of oil, so we're gonna use the stoke to the stock first. We're just gonna put it on your thumb, and you're gonna work it back and forth down this woodwork and it will drink it up, absolutely drink it up. Remember this stuff dries quite hard and running it up and down in straight lines will hide it better if it, you A, get marked or anything like that, plus it will give you more control as you work the wheel around the gun. I mean, here's me hoping this gun was going to turn out like a grade 5, but oh, there's a little bit of fiddle back there, so if you guys can see that, there's a little bit of fiddle back there. Oh, nice inclusion. No, it's not that ugly at all. And again, you want to avoid the checkering ever so. All right, uh, so now we've actually got some oil in here. About five coats uh, of, of quick, because it will absorb and it will absorb and absorb, and as soon as it slows absorbing, then it's time to rub. And you use your hands to build heat with this, and that will really just work it into the wood. We're still a long way off finish, by the way. However, not even funny, this is, this is more effort than most manufacturers will put into their wood finish. The best bit about this is uh, your hands. You can touch anything and it'll never rust. It isn't horrible by any means. Let's chuck it up there for you. It's just to take oil and oil and oil, especially where it's just this cheap kiln dried crap wood. Uh, but the finer point on it, it dries bone. So it's almost all the more important to keep it waterproof. All right, my hand's getting tired. So. We're about to cool it on this one. So the smear marks don't matter so much to start with, but as soon as the wood stops taking oil, it will sit on top 
They're absolutely rock hard. So, so my last lick of oil. And we're on real quick successive coats here, just getting this wood drunk. And then we're going to leave it and let it soak in and dry and the wood will tell us what to do next. So, see you in an hour. You join me um, and I have made up a special pot of wet wax for this beautiful gun. So essentially I'm hard feeling this now. It's had plenty of coats of this magic stuff, um, which doesn't dry that quickly. Uh, Hence the different lighting outside. And so what I'm doing is I'm just move, putting this wax and just, it's very wet, so I'm just putting it into the wood, slowly but surely. Uh, but it's significantly drier than that, and hopefully, between the two of them, this will give us a fairly nice finish. Uh, the beauty of this finish is it's ongoing. So we're not going to seal the wood, there's going to be no finishing oil, there's no top coat, there's no hard, hard wax. This is an entirely maintainable, buildable finish. Uh, hence we're showing it to you, because actually, you know what, you can go home and you can, with a gun with this finish, and you can oil away to your heart's content. You're never going to hurt it, you're never going to remove any of the finish, it's going to remain this beautiful satin colour for the rest of time, and the world will be a better place. You make sure you work it all in, again, like with all this stuff, removing smears and keeping out the checkering is important. In reality, if we're doing this for a customer, uh, and we're doing a proper long-term job, what you do is a completely different thing that we might do. This is cheap to charm in, man. All right, we're happy with this. And I'm just gonna really heat up. It's got massive beeswax content. So, really heat it up and work it in. I'm gonna do that all over. And then we're going to leave it, and then we're going to come back to it. Unfortunately, with the heat, actually, again, you can find the grain raises again on a cheaper gun like this. Hence the kettle trick, so handy to kind of bypass all that. But last thing I want is a comment. So, John, I bought a kettle of oil, boiling water on my gun, and the stock split in three. What am I supposed to do, man? That would not be bueno. No, that would be. Non bueno. Oh, Dave, you touched my wood. Dave's seal of approval. That's a bit of a shame. But oh, it's a real crime shame. Could do better. Uh, no. You've got to seal that. If you don't, don't care. Don't care. Cheap to charm him. Okay, a. A gun that we're putting loads and loads of effort in to that we don't care about. We do care about actually, because it's kind of a display of skill. But I also like to think that if anybody, you know, looks at this objectively, they'll also realise that we're capable of much, much better. Well, it's um, a good gauge. Somebody can buy one of these from us for bugger all, take it home, and do that to it. And uh, follow the series. Not being funny, and you've got a ten times better gun for this it. This gun actually is starting to look. Ten times better. Quite nice. Anyway, so I'm going to put that somewhere to go and harden off. Yeah. Go long. Go long. Now we're just going to do much the same to the fore end. And I think the answer with this whole series, guys, is uh, that we might do another one. The real hard part is I can't remember what this gun looked like to start with. However, as we draw to a close of this wonderful episode, what we're actually going to do is um, not show you the finished product. I can't genuinely remember what this looked like before. Next time you see this gun, it will be fully reassembled and we will be doing a side by side comparison between this, the cheap to charming, the charming version versus the cheap version. Um, draw some conclusions as to whether this was actually a worthwhile investment of my time and B, hopefully get out to the range. Oh, burnt me out. And um, I'm going to get someone objective, aka okay, Dave, uh, the most hypercritical person of any of my work in the entire world uh, who hates just about anything. You know, cheap and nasty, and pretty much any gun doesn't say browning on it, or that isn't a side by side. Uh, or Maruku, to be fair, or Beretta. Well, it, it's just a hypercritical gun nut. Loves guns, but uh, no, he's a gun snob, a bashed gun snob. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take these two arrange, do a side by side comparison of the two visually, uh, see what aesthetic improvements we've made, see what handling and grip improvements we've made, see which one we prefer. 
and then uh, see if there's actually any shootability difference between them. Uh, and I'm going to take David for that, obviously, because he's the most hypercritical person I know. And these guns might actually fit him a little better than me. This one's going to be a bit low for him, but I don't care. We'll talk about how they swing around. Maybe I could just do it on the simulator. I know you guys hate that. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Take care. Goodbye.